Hi. So today I had the wonderful opportunity to speak in front of about 2,000 people from Asia about my personal journey and how I implement um, technologies like processing and basically creative coding into my uh, workflow as a graphic designer and how this basically changed everything. So um, hope you enjoyed the talk and yeah, let me know what you think. So, hi, it's super amazing to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thanks, Tony. Thanks to Zui Biche team. I think this is the right way to say it. Maybe if not, then please uh, dare with me. Uh, I tried my best to spell this right in Chinese. Um, yeah, so uh, it's wonderful to be here in this kind of digital meetup. My name is Tim and I'm an uh, educator, designer and community builder around this topic of creative coding, of programming with an artistic purpose. And um, well, I have lots of students around the world and they learn uh, to create things that look like this, right? But this is, this is just the front end of what my students learn, right? In the back end, they learn much more how to tackle problems uh, in terms of digitalization, how to approach digital technologies, how to build a mindset uh, to, um, you know, approaching technologies in, the, in a good way. And that's what really inspires me pretty much and what's very, very, it's a wonderful thing to do, right? Um, yeah, thanks Tony again for the recommendations to brush up my talk. Uh, I just split my talk into three chapters. The first one is Unexplored Territories, which is, um, you know, a little storytelling about where I come from and what brought me here today. Um, these, the second part is much shorter. It's um, in the second part, I just uh, tell you a bit about what I do today and um, yeah, what, what kind of how I approach this empowering of young creatives. And the third chapter is also very short. It's about, you know, some recommendations, some tips I want to give you. And uh, this is, I think this is a, then a great link to go over to the uh, Q&A section, right? So let's get started. Unexplored territories. That's me with my father. And um, yeah, we have a very intense relationship and he was a very huge inspiration for me my whole life. I love this image. Um, it is probably about 30 years old. And um, yeah, we were on a beach. I think this was in Netherlands in Europe. And um, I don't remember the day, but I really like this image. <laughs> and that's me with 17, right? Being you know, searching for my way, trying to find out how the world works, being kind of, you know, sometimes frustrated, sometimes very motivated, kind of a very creative person I've ever been. And um, yeah, that's me with 17. With 19, I took my bike um, and uh, I made a trip from Cologne to Paris, which is about 600 kilometers. And that took a few weeks and was a very, very inspiring and very influential um, journey and travel for me. So I really like to take detours. Of course, I could take the train or the plane or whatever. Mm, but sometimes I like this way or being low tech, right? Trying to solve problems in a low tech way. And this was my first very low tech experience using a bike. <laughs> cycling to Paris, which was amazing. That's me. Um, when I discovered photography, which was kind of, for me, a very, very important discovery because uh, I used the camera for a long time or for some years to express myself. And this image was kind of a very intense experience with the phenomenon of reduction, of reducing things to the, you know, to the, to the, very minimal to the essence, right? What I like about this picture is that you can see the just light painting around my head and it just shows the uh, silhouette of my body. But you can see that it's me, if you know me, um, in a way. And yeah, I really like this image. It's just a symbol or a metaphor for reduction for me. And this was a very intense experience. Yeah, 2008 was the year when I started studying at the Münster School of Design, 
Um, I have to say that I grew up in a family of designers. My father always had a design business and uh, he had about 25 to 30 employees in the 90s. So it was a very successful design agency in the time. Mm. But for me, it was like I didn't want to go to work really in the company of my father. For me, I wanted to go deeper in this more artistic direction in graphic design. And that's why I decided to study graphic design in, in Münster. And um, yeah, that was a pretty, pretty good experience. So these are some of the uh, some of the uh, rooms that we had there. A very modern building, very clean architecture, very inspiring place, right? Um, I really enjoyed being there. And uh, oh, and I also did a semester abroad in Lisbon. Lisbon is in the very west or the southwest of uh, Europe. And it's a warm place. It's very beautiful. It has very nice ancient architecture, um, his, a, a very rich history. And this was a really uh, also a very, very intense experience for me. Yeah. So if you don't know me, I think it's quite important if you if we speak about my creative work, it's important that you understand that I'm really coming from this field of music. I'm making music since I'm a child and um, while studying, I uh, focused pretty much on producing electronic music. That was something I was doing already since I was 15. But in that time, especially while studying, I was really focusing on creating, you know, compositions with a software called Reason. And this was kind of the setup that I had, right? Very, very nice place where I was able to put my ideas into, <laughs> into audible um, sound waves. And um, yeah, one day a friend of mine came to me from Münster and told me, come on, why don't we play live, right? Why don't we get on stage? And I was kind of, you know, I was a little bit hesitating with that because I felt more attracted to composition than, of, than uh, to be on stage and, you know, uh, expose myself to an uh, audience. That was something I was not super comfortable with, even if I had bands when I was younger. but. Um, he told me that we should do that and we did it and it was fantastic. We had a wonderful time, played in Münster live gigs on festivals and clubs and that was really, really cool. Mm. And what also was very inspiring for me was working as a tutor. Well, when I came back from, from Lisbon to Münster to continue my studies, I became a tutor for elementary design. And this was interesting for myself from two perspectives. The first one is that I experienced how powerful design can be uh, in ter if we reduce things to their core, to their essence, right? So in that time I was, I was researching the Bauhaus and how elementary design works, what kind of tools, ge basic geometric shapes can be to express specific things and that was very influential. And at the same time as working as a tutor, I experienced that I'm that I really enjoy working with people and that, that I really enjoy teaching and empowering empowering young people. So that was a very, very influential um, two very influential years while working as a tutor in at the Münster School of Design. But one day for most of us, studying is over, finished, and we have to make a decision, right? I had to make, make a decision which way I want to take. And because I didn't see any possibility to get a design or to get a job as a lecturer in a design university, which was kind of my dream at that time, right? Um, I was a bit, little bit confused because I didn't really know which way to go. Uh, but my father offered me a position in his newly founded furniture company, right? He founded a company for um, office furniture. And he asked me if, the, if I want to do the marketing. And I said, yes, kind of. It was not, you know, it, I was kind of confused and I was not really sure which way to go. And this sounded like a good idea. The problem was I had to go back to my hometown, Paderborn, where I still live. At that time, that was a problem for me, right? Today, I really like it here, but that's another story. Um, 
yeah, that's me. Kind of confused with my job, but still in love with music. I <laughs> earned my own, uh, my first money and I bought lots of devices like looper, a looper, a synthesizer, drum machine, some effects. And I started to build a live show without a computer. That was a challenge that I was setting myself. Again, there's this low tech thought, right? Low technology thought. No computer on stage. What can I create if I focus completely on working with hardware without any software, right? So that was really nice. I had these knobs and, and these, these cables there. It was very, very homemade, very DIY. And I made this techno electronic sound. And well, p people were really, really enjoying this. This was a, on a new, new Year's Eve party and people were really getting crazy. It was an amazing night and I really enjoyed that. It was super crazy and super cool. <laughs> yeah, uh, 2014, I met Patrick, Patrick Hübner. And uh, he's also a designer or at that time. He was a very, very um, successful designer. We met in Paderborn and he worked in an e-commerce agency. So that means he was very, very good in creating online shops, creating designs for online shops that sell products. He was super, he's, he was amazing in this, right? And um, But at the same time, we shared the same problem because he was also very bored of his job and he didn't feel like that was not something that really made him totally happy because he was already doing this since many, many years. And um, that was the reason why we thought about what we could do together, right? How we could maybe start something completely free, something creative without any, uh, well, you know, financial uh, goals or something, just doing something creative together. And we came up with the idea that we, he could make the visuals for my music. And because Patrick is a programmer or he started as a programmer when, when he was 12, he's very, very good in coding. Um, um, after a few discussions, it was kind of natural that he would do these visuals with code, with a programming language. And, you know, things just came together. I showed him this book, Generative Design, which was published in 2009. A very, very influential book for the scene of creative coding and generative design, right? Uh, you really should have a um, look into it. It's pretty good. And, um, yeah. It shows complex visuals that um, are created with a programming, programming language called Processing. Processing was at that time, it was released, I think, in 2001 or 2002. And um, yeah, it was a completely new way, especially in this world of communication designers, to generate visuals and generate graphics. And um, yeah, in the end, we came up with a live show that where we had a very, very interesting USP, a unique selling point. We had an electronic music project where we had audio reactive visuals. This was our first concert in 2014 and as you can see there's a there's a projector it was very small in a, in a shop i was playing my music and in the back we had these amazing generative visuals yeah this was a very very beautiful <laughs> moment in my life um yeah we decided to scale the project a bit to get to get uh, to, or to do the next step we just recorded a video because we wanted to book concerts and gigs and here you can see pretty good how it just worked you know i had these machines in front of me i was just using these knobs to uh well adjust the sounds and loop them and you know this was very intense and very stressful for me but it was really cool really improvised right 
at, at the back you can see the projection. Patrick just we just put a projector onto the back of the stage or projected at the back of the stage. And what you see there are audio reactive visuals. That means these visuals react in real time to the music. That means Patrick wrote a software that takes the music and converted it into visuals, right? So it recorded the sound of the room um, and put it into the processing application that he created and converted it to a signal that we were able to, um, to project at the back of the stage. And that was magical, right? So I just recognize that there is this pattern, right? This very, very simple pattern. He took the music and converted it into visual, right? He took an input and converted it into an output. So I thought about that and I came up with this graphic. So if we think about the input output idea as an abstract model, right? We could, in theory, we could take any kind of data and put it or transform it into any kind of medium, right? So this is, you know, this has, this graphic shows so many possibilities of what kind of generative projects could be realized. So you could make a, you know, a chair out of your favorite book or um, a sculpture out of the finance data of the, you know, shiny stock market or a poster out of your favorite film, right? So the, the possibilities are truly incredible. There's so much possible with generative design. Yeah, in that time we uh, had a new um, person in our band, Stefan Schneider, a very a wonderful drummer, right? And it was super, a wonderful person. I really love this guy. He's, he's amazing. And um, we teamed up to form the Inuvik Collective. Together we wanted to play tours, we wanted to record videos and maybe record an album. That was a really cool time, uh, basically. Or the ideas, we had really amazing ideas about that. But there was a problem <laughs> because I started to get so bored of making music. I felt like I was so inspired by what Patrick did, right? It was so inspiring how, how, how wonderful these things were that Patrick created with code. And I felt like I made music since many, many years. And now I felt this pressure and I wanted to break out of this, right? It was really a very, very tough crisis for me. And I decided to break up. And as you can imagine, Stefan and Patrick were absolutely not happy about this because they also um, dedicated their whole free time to this project. But I felt like I cannot go on like this. But luckily, after a few weeks, I mean, that was really a crisis and I had a very bad kind of <laughs> uh, conflict with Patrick, we decided to restart the thing and um, he saw that I was very interested in creative coding and we decided to restart. And he, I wanted to learn this by myself and I thought it would be great to do this together, Patrick and me. He could teach me what he knows, I could teach him what I know. So that was uh, the idea basically. And we did, we did something unusual, right? We rented a cabin in the woods of Witzenhausen, which, which is a very, very small village here in the, close to the area where I live. And um, together with a friend, Lukas, we just rented this cabin <laughs> in the green, in the woods. Uh, it was completely cut off the internet connection, right? We were there about five days. We had no internet. We were not really able to uh, do c phone calls. So that was great because we were really focusing on creative coding and trying to find out how all these things work. And in that time, I started to making these GIFs, right? That was kind of the first thing I did with processing, creating GIF files. And, you know, this is basically how it looks if you start working with for loops and these very fundamental concepts in processing. And I just created these, you know, perfect loops, upload them to Tumblr. And uh, yeah, that was pretty amazing. That was my Tumblr blog. And <laughs> after a few weeks and months, I was very, very active there, just posting my work daily. It was very inspiring to see that people really shared my work and uh, reacted to it. I was getting, you know, emails and people said that it inspires them. I was popping up at the search for creative coding on Google, on Pinterest and Tumblr. So that was really, really cool to see, right? Um, 
Yeah, and this is probably my most successful GIF, and um, I still really love this. It is based on image data, and I analyze this image data and create this kind of virtual three-dimensional sculpture out of it. Um, this is based on the same principle. Yeah, and as you can see, there's a huge complexity in these visuals, right? It's just a very kind of um, interesting complexity that looks very interesting. Yeah, so the next step was to um, apply this input-output pattern to my projects, right? To think more about the input, the, the data. And because I'm a musician, as you already know, um, this is me playing the uh, prelude in C by the wonderful Johann Sebastian Bach. Um, this is something I've learned while studying in, in Münster. I uh, practiced piano a lot and I really had the goal to play this piece out of my head without any notes. Um, but in 2000, and I think this was 2015, I recognized that the sheet music for this piece um, is perfect to, or is a, is a wonderful data set to work with generative design because it is based on arpeggios. That means these notes, there's only just one note at a time and they are just um, kind of, uh, how to say that? I mean, that's just this one note at a time and this structure is very rhythmic and very clean and that's why I thought it would be amazing to see what kind of visuals I could create out of this music right so first of all I had to take the whole data right I was taking the MIDI data from a website somebody was very active by just taking all the notes putting them into a MIDI file and then I had to convert these MIDI notes into a JSON uh, array and uh, that was basically the, the data foundation for my Bach project, right? And with this data, I was able to just transform these nodes into specific colors, shapes, and tones of grayscale. Yeah, and these were some of the results. Basically, this is the music by the wonderful Johann Sebastian Bach visualized with colors, right? So these images have the personality of this music inside of them. That's magical, right? If you just look at them, it's it's just an image. It's just a it's just a graphic. But basically, this graphic has the 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 magic of the music of Johann Sebastian Bach in them. And this is also, um, by the way, very important. These are just mockups, right? This is how I work when I try to simulate real situations. These um, images were not printed or something. There was just a digital research project. But I often use. Uh, graphics and and these visualizations to show what could be possible with that and this is also just a mock-up but it um, what I find very interesting in this image is that if you cut the graphic in the half right if you would cut the the uh, whole visual in the half the left and the right side would be exactly the same which shows that the music of Johann Sebastian Bach is enwrought with magical patterns right with math with beauty with logic and it's, it, it's, it's just beautiful, it's just wonderful. Yeah, so another mock-up, <laughs> faking an application. I mean, think of this. Maybe there is something like a huge Bach festival in, in the year 2100 and, I don't know, 2150, and this could be used for the corporate design to, you know, the music could be painted onto the whole city. Wouldn't that be beautiful? I think, yes. Another mock-up. Yeah, so here's a very, very quick um, showcase I've made in the beginning of 2018. So about three years ago. Um, yeah, there, were, there are so already some um, kind of applied projects that I did for clients. That's quite interesting because then in that time the first clients just came and asked me to do some some work for them. This, uh, and I also had some submissions for um, well screenings on video festivals and that was really really cool. So yeah, it was pretty amazing. 
And what I also did is I founded a group called Creative Coding Days and I also became an active member in several Facebook groups about generative design and creative coding. And one day I thought, why don't we connect in real life? I mean, it's kind of boring to just type on a keyboard. Wouldn't it be amazing if we just could meet in a real place with real people having a good time, right? And um, in 2015, we started the first meetup called Creative Coding Days. Uh, in the Netherlands, right? So we, we met in, in Nijgemerdum, which is a place in northern Holland. You probably don't know it because it's a very, very small place. But these are some people coming from London, Amsterdam, um, Oslo, which is in Norway, and um, Patrick and me. At the right, you see Ria. It's, she's a wonderful person, an artist from, uh, from the Netherlands. We just connected and met and it was magical right we just put out together our computers uh, we were cooking discussing having a fantastic time and just exchanging ideas which was super inspiring and this is we were just repeated this um, the next two or three years and in the third year we had about i think 18 15 or 220 people or something like that which was amazing right coming from cities like paris london um, Amsterdam, uh, Berlin, uh, you know, all over Europe, which was magical. Yeah, that was really, really cool. Yeah, and I was getting my first public speaking gigs for talking about generative design and creative coding. Well, for me, it was always very interesting to think about the why and think about the, the basic, the, basically the philosophy and the purpose and the, uh, well, the, um, the theory of this whole technology thing that is kind of a very huge um, topic these days, right? I mean, everything is digitalized and that's something I'm thinking about pretty often, pretty much. Yeah, that's me at the Dutch Design Week in 2018. Yeah, and here we come to the chapter two, empowering young creatives, which is basically what I do today, right? Um, it started with my first teaching uh, assignment or my first request to teach communications designers in Germany um, the art of programming. And in that time, I just remembered how these creative coding courses looked back in the days when I was studying in Münster. To be honest, they were super boring, right? That's what people told me. So that was the, pro the problem was that the teacher never told the students why this is important. The teacher just told them that they should do these exercises and these assignments, but nobody really felt inspired about it. Nobody really felt the power of this technology. And that's why I thought about how could I create a course for creative coding that is immersive for communication designers, graphic designers. That's something that interests them, something that touches them, right? Something where they can really um, be creative, really, you know, express themselves with the tools that they usually use as communications designers. And that's the moment when I just created this research uh, before kicking, kicking off this course called Programming Posters. Well, basically, I was setting a very strict framework of rules, like, you know, use a specific color, use specific fonts, use a specific way of, you know, visuality of graphic graphic style and create dozens of variations of typographic posters and yeah as i said the goal was to just to infect kind of uh, communications design with this idea that communication design can be fluid can be programmed can be interactive can be data driven and you know this um, revealed so many in important questions about philosophy about the how we want to live in the future and how powerful technologies can be if we really understand how they work under the hood. And yeah, that was a wonderful, wonderful experience and wonderful project that really shaped everything in my life. That was a class in Camp Linford. So it was an international mm -hmm. class of people from Russia, India, China, uh, Germany, of course, uh, Turkey. So uh, that, that was really cool. I really enjoyed that. And this is the Hochschule Rheinwald in Camp Lindford, a very modern uh, university where um, yeah, I was giving this course. Pretty amazing place. Yeah, the Page uh, magazine, which is kind of the most, well, one of the 
hugest or largest design magazines in Germany just brought this six page article about the project, which was crazy for me. I was super surprised about that. I mean, I've just sent them some material, but I didn't really expect that they are going to publish something about that. But they were getting in touch with me and asked me if they can uh, publish an article about that. And that was, I mean, six pages, that's crazy. That was super crazy for me. And I experienced that this topic is very important and it's it's something that many people think about. How can design be or how can design look like in the future? What are the future methodologies to think about design, design systems, building or creating graphic design? Yeah, and uh, the second semester there was my group in Dortmund. <laughs> there were 55 students in the class, which was crazy. I was just entering the room and, you know, think about that. I mean, I was super surprised. 55 people in this room. Uh, that was super stressful, to be honest. It was a lot of work, mm, very long sessions, but it was extremely... I loved it. I, I love teaching, right? That's what I really, really like. And uh, yeah, it was a wonderful time. Yeah, so um, 2019, I was speaking in front of many, many people, I think 700 people or something that was also crazy about um, programming posters and basically the theory, theory behind um, because program, programming posters is basically a project where design really touches or overlaps with technology, which is a very, very important topic. And um, yeah, that was a huge thing for me as well. Yeah, last year I gave this workshop at the uh, ECAL, Lausanne. They are pretty amazing. So the students start programming very early and um, they are really integrating this whole um, difficult field of um, programming into their curriculum very early. And that's basically, from my perspective, the key to build a modern design academy. This is super important and they do a great job in that. So today, this is where I sit now, right? I sit on this gymnastic ball right now in front of my computer. <laughs> this is the place right now during the COVID crisis, which I, uh, you know, I'm pretty often here. This is where I teach. This is where I create my e-learning platform, where I work on my projects and where I spend a lot of time. So I'm very proud and I'm super happy to be able today to say that I empower young creatives. Remember, I told you 10 years ago, um, that was already my goal. And today I can say that I reached it and it's, it's just wonderful. Um, yeah, I'm very happy about this. Um, yeah, and in my work, I focus on supporting students building a digital literacy. I focus pretty much on education by building my own e-learning platform. And of course, I'm working a lot on my community about the teaching I do. So. Um, I have this uh, page, this website, where I publish um, tutorials and a lot of content, a lot of thoughts and also, you know, themes about philosophy, all about um, creative coding technologies, how we can implement them in our creative workflows, what kind of roles these technologies play in our life today. And uh, yeah, so it started off with YouTube tutorials today. I have a comprehensive e-learning platform on my website where I just uh, present a lot of work. And this is one of these meetups that we did, right? So we meet twice a month, uh, me with my patrons, and we just swap ideas about, um, yeah, uh, technologies, um, COVID-19, <laughs> things that just move us, that touch us, that, that, you know, it's really nice, especially in these times, con to connect with people worldwide, um, uh, around this topic of creative coding technologies, design, art, and how to go, how to step further. Yeah, so I know this video is very quick. I hope this is not too annoying for you, but this is basically a very um, brief overview of my website. As I said, I've got courses on my website. Uh, people can get patrons, so they can make a Patreon account and then get access to all these courses. Tutorials are free for everyone, but courses have to be paid. Um, and yeah, I share a lot of content there. That's basically what I do full time now. I have this, um, yeah, this Patreon community. And today I'm 
able to really focus my whole energy onto teaching, onto building my own curriculum and thinking about how to empower young creatives these days, which is, yeah, fantastic. It's a lot of fun. Now, we come to the uh, last and most important chapter, probably, maybe, <laughs> um, because I just collected some recommendations I want to give my students and young people who want to start to learn technologies. And uh, these are some, some, yeah, some suggestions and some things I want to tell you if you want to get started with creative coding or just working with technologies that are kind of maybe at the first sight hard to learn. First of all, <laughs> you need to be patient. Right? So you won't learn a technology like processing in one week. It takes years, right? It is a commitment. It is something that you have to decide for, that you have to, it takes a long time, right? But it's amazing. You can enjoy this time. It can be, it can be a good time. And um, yeah, I, th I think patience is something that many people don't have these days, but it really, really helps if you want to kickstart your career or your path as a creative technologist. Sketch daily. That's what I did when I created my Tumblr blog, right? Um, this Tumblr was the place where I just shared my ideas. And it is, it is very, very helpful and empowering if you see that people share and like your work. That's amazing. People can connect with you. You can connect with your work or through your work with a community of people who do exactly the same. And that's huge, right? That's We are living in times of the internet. And this is one of the major benefits of the internet, that we can connect with people that have the same interests. And sketching daily and sharing the work is uh, imp very important. Yeah, so embrace imperfection. Uh, I mean, generative design is computer generated. The computer takes decisions. And when a computer takes decisions, we often end up in imperfect results, right? A human would do things pretty different than a computer. But, you know, that's part of the process. In the beginning, this, this, the, the aspect of losing control is the part of the learning process. So it's very important to understand that, especially for beginners, you should embrace imperfection and try to get comfortable with it, right? The goal is to gain control over the systems, but in the beginning, it's important to have, you know, to, to get your head around this, this problem. Enjoy failure, right? Failing is something that's a huge part of the learning process. It can be fun. It can be fun to make mistakes. And um, yeah, I think this is also something that we should try enjoying failure instead of being angry to us and being, uh, yeah, avoiding them. Trust the process. This is basically a part of stay patient, right? Sometimes you have a goal and it, it seems to be very far away, <laughs> right? But for me, especially in very complex software pro development projects that I just did in the recent years, I, I learned that trusting the process and knowing that I will reach the goal. If I just go on and, you know, solve the problem steps, step by step, um, you know, uh, one task after the other. It will lead you to the goal, but you have to stay patient. That's very important. Join a community, connect with people, right? Connect with people with the same interest. There are so many communities out there. I have a com community for creative coders. There are many others and um, connecting with people is also very important. Start today. Why not starting today? I mean, this is a wonderful day to be in Germany. The sun is shining, but even if it's raining in China, I don't know. This is the wonderful <laughs> point of time to get started. So that was my talk and I want to say thank you very much to Zui Bichet. Hopefully I didn't, I spelled it right. And uh, yeah, enjoy.